I'm Steve Fisher. Do you drive an electric car? Congratulations, you have one foot in the future. If not, why not? Is it range anxiety? Fear of the new? Price too high? Soon you won't have a choice. According to reporter David Curley, they're here to stay. The car makers have decided this is the future. They have been told by their customers, by countries where they sell, that this is what we want. David's here to talk about the transportation transformation on Life Slices. Welcome to the show, David Curley. I'm going to ask you a question that I ask everybody. Don't feel intimidated. Okay. Who is David Curley? David Curley is an American journalist who has spent decades covering everything from politics and natural disasters, hurricanes, floods, and everything else, international politics, travel the world on a network's dime, and enjoys life. Well, that's certainly a good thing to do. So you went from being a general assignment reporter and anchor to focusing on transportation. How did that come about? So I worked in the Washington, D.C. Bureau of ABC News for 16 years, and I was a general assignment correspondent for 10 of those years, uh, which is in the ABC world, ABC News world, kind of a difficult position to live in because uh, they don't really want another story from Washington, D.C. We've already heard from the White House and the Pentagon and the State Department and Capitol Hill. We don't need another Washington, D.C. story. So it was always difficult to, to get stories bought from Washington, D.C. And so I always said I wanted to beat. I covered the White House for a couple of years. And I moved around to every building. I covered the Iraq war quite a bit. I did my fair share of natural disasters and the transportation beat came up. I had covered Boeing in Seattle during my time as a local reporter and anchor in Seattle. And then I went to Chicago and Boeing went to Chicago. So I covered Boeing a little bit there. So I knew a bit about aviation. I had a toy train set, loved trains, knew a bit about that. <laughs> Lionel? No, American Flyer, total American Flyer, big AF guy, S gauger. That's the way to do it. It's more realistic. And I'm a, a little bit of a wrench on cars. So the, the beat really fit for me. Planes, trains, automobiles, and space. You know, I, I remember the landing on the moon and always been fascinated by space. So this kind of, it worked for me. It was a beat. It was something I could concentrate on as a journalist where you're going deeper. You're not just doing the superficial. You understand how this story in the context of, of what it means in the, in the bigger picture. So I, I said, yeah, I'm happy to do the transportation beat and loved it. Okay. Look, so now I have to start with lay the groundwork here. What kind of car do you drive? Well, we have a few of them. I have my, what I call my Costco, Home Depot, and dog car, which <laughs> is a Honda Element. My son and I went to the auto show in Chicago in, I guess it was 2001, and saw the Element when it was brand new. And I thought, wow, this is really cool. They built it for, you know, late teens, early 20s surfers, but it was people my age who really love that vehicle. So that's one of them. My, we have a Prius in the family. We have a Ford Explorer at, at a, th that we store and use occasionally. And then I have a BMW uh, 335i that is my baby. I drive a Prius, so I know from the joys of that. So let's let's get down to the nitty gritty here. The popularity of electric vehicles is growing. What's standing in the way of full adoption? Production of the number of vehicles needed and the infrastructure to charge them, whether that's at your home or at a public charging station. You know, I get a lot of interesting comments when I write on full throttle about electric vehicles. The car makers have decided this is the future. They have been told by their customers, by countries where they sell, that this is what we want. And, and they are going, some of them all in, and a few of them are, are speeding up their adoption of EVs. So they're going you know, full throttle on... Yes, they are going full throttle on EVs. And if you ever go full throttle on a new EV, you will know what torque is. You will know how fast a car can actually move. There are a couple limiting factors. Uh, you know, people like to talk about the grid and charging and infrastructure. That's all kind of happening. I mean, this is like, think about when Ford was building the Model Ts. I mean, there wasn't a gas station on every corner. You had to find some place to get gasoline. Uh, we're, we're having the, those same kind of issues now. 
The other limiting factor are, are batteries and the minerals that go inside the batteries, but uh, there are, there's a lot of work on mining and refining and recycling of those, those minerals that go into batteries that it's, it's all, you know, it's, it's not working perfectly, but you can see each of them hopscotching these different parts of the equation moving as we adopt EVs. Are we treating one threat to the environment for another? You might be able to argue that, but I think the, the biggest concern are CO2 emissions and internal combustion engines are a huge contributor to that. I'm not, I'm not a climate scientist and I'm not, I don't pretend to be an expert on all this, but if you're having a problem because too much of something is happening, if you reduce part of it, that seems to help. And I think that's what the world is saying and why car makers are responding. Is that like, hey, we can do something about this. We can cut CO2 emissions from our personal vehicles by doing this. So let's do it. Now, how you produce the electricity and whether you use more alternatives, how you're able to store it, all those things are happening. This is, you know, I call, I call my newsletter the uh, transportation transformation. I really think this decade from 20 to 30, you might be able to go to 35, the amount of change that's going to happen and the way we get from here to there is just going to, it's striking. And, and, a lot of people aren't ready for it and it's going really fast, but it's happening. I mean, it's, and that, that's kind of what I, I do is I report on what are they doing and why are they doing it? So I know that one thing that's keeping people that like myself and others that I know uh, away from electric vehicles right now is range anxiety. I now, I have moved to a town that's two and a half hours away from my kids. So if I want to visit them, I have to jump on the road and drive two and a half hours. And uh, I'm concerned that an electric vehicle won't get me there and back without the hassle of recharging. Well, you'd have to get gas, wouldn't you, if you took a gas vehicle car? I do have a gas vehicle car. so I'd, And I'd, if, if you go, at some point, you have to stop and get, you have to refuel, right? Right, right. Well, so, no, because it's a Prius, so I get pretty good mileage in the Prius. You can do a, you can do a round trip on the Prius? Yes. That's great. That's yeah. fantastic. Yeah. Um, which is why hybrids and, and Toyota, we could talk about this later, Toyota is sticking with hybrids and many others are going full on EVs. But this is why Toyota thinks that there's this bridge between where we are today, getting the infrastructure and everything else. And that is the hybrid uh, like you're driving right now, which is why they're going to be one of the biggest hybrid producers over the next several years. Yes, I understand range anxiety. I uh, Ford gave me a Mach-E. They call it a Mustang. It's not a Mustang, but a Mach-E crossover that I drove down into rural Virginia. And I learned a lot about charging and range anxiety. I left the house with 100%. I passed the last supercharger with 80% and then drove all the way down to where I was going, which was actually to watch a rocket launch. And I didn't have enough power to get back to that supercharger. Mm. And so I had to stop at a couple of uh, level two chargers and sit and twiddle my thumbs for a long time. So I completely understand what you're talking about. I think the uh, generally 300 miles is probably going to be the range of EVs that you see over the next couple of years. If you want to save money, your range will be lower because they won't give you a big enough battery to get the kind of range you're looking for. But the infrastructure is coming. And what you have to do is just think differently. So in my little example there, at 80%, I should have stopped at the supercharger and gone to 90 or 95% because I could have gotten all the way down to where I was going and back to that supercharger where in 20 minutes I'd get enough easily to get on to where I wanted to do. It's real. I understand range anxiety. But once again, this is the process of bringing on this new technology. And you'll get to the point where I, I did a story on Electrify America, which is one of the charging companies that's out there. You've seen several if you have. A, do you have a plug-in hybrid? Are you able to plug yours in? No. Yeah. Um, so uh, it's Electrify, a plain old hybrid. Yeah, I am yeah. trying to get it outfitted with a wheel and hamsters to see if I can. <laughs> yeah, we should actually talk. I think Chevy had a, a good idea on what to do with hybrids, different than Toyota. Anyway, Electrify America's CEO, I went over and did a story on them. They have to figure out cars from different makers charge differently at different rates. It can only take so much juice at a time. 
And so they have to figure out how their charger can work with it. And I was talking with the CEO and they are now at 350 megawatts, kilowatts, excuse me. And he's talking about they're going to one gig. And he basically said, you should only have to wait four or five minutes at a charging station like you do at a gas station to get a full charge. I think that's a little bit down the road, but I'm all for it too. Yeah. I mean, we all want to kind of get along the road and along down the road. Another another problem with EVs, I was told by my daughter-in-law was sh- actually shopping for an EV and they were told by their insurance guy that it was going to double their insurance. And I talked to my insurance guy and he said the same thing that yes, for electric vehicles, insurance is much higher. Are we ever going to see a, a respite from that? Well, that sounds like a great story because I don't know much about that and I can't add much to that. But listen, it's going to become, we will be 50-50 ICE, internal combustion engines and EVs here by 2030. So yeah, something's going to have to happen there. I'm, that sounds like a great story. I'm going to look into that. I am kind of surprised that without all our technical know-how, that nobody has or that I'm aware of has come up with a an artificial fuel for combustion engines. Oh no, there is they're they're out there. Um, in fact, the airline industry uh, they call it SAF, SAF, Sustainable Airline Fuel, and that's the way the airlines hope to be greener. So that's all coming. I mean, I haven't written this piece, but I've thought about this piece as well. So you make it from plant based materials but you burn it and you still have emissions. It's cleaner, but it's not completely clean. I thought you might've been going to hydrogen, which a lot of people talk about hydrogen, uh, not just in a fuel cell, which creates electricity, but actually burning hydrogen as a fuel. Some people are looking into. Hydrogen's a very tricky little molecule. And if you look at the Hindenburg, it can be very dangerous. So there are other options out there. I just think the car makers have decided that battery electric vehicles is where they're going right now, still waiting for this other technology to develop. I mentioned Toyota early. Toyota is big, would like to do hydrogen, especially hydrogen fuel cells, where you basically run the hydrogen through and through electrolysis, you create water and, and some electricity. And interesting technology, but you have to be able to stop at a station and fill up a tank with hydrogen, and, and you're driving around with a tank of hydrogen, which is explosive. I mean, people talk about the batteries in EVs. They, they are problematic as well, and we've seen plenty of fires. And down in Hurricane Ian, there were plenty of issues with batteries and salt water, and that's not good. But these are all issues we have to deal with along the way of this transformation. I saw a story once on using atomic energy to fuel, to power a car, and I immediately had a vision in my head of every time there was a fender bender, a mushroom cloud would go up. <laughs> and it's like, I don't think that's a very good uh, solution. Well, it sounds like the DeLorean, right? With Back to the Future. <laughs> a little bit. It was, I think that was fusion, though. It wasn't fission. In what ways will new models have more self-driving technology? So autonomy is a whole different thing and very interesting. We use autonomy in a, in a lot of vehicles already. If you've if flown any time in the last 10 years, your plane has probably been on autopilot autonomy. In fact, it's caused some problems when pilots uh, haven't intervened correctly. And it's, it's not a perfect science yet, but it is coming. And and my line about autonomy is it's about getting humans out of the loop. We're the problem. We're the ones who make the mistakes. Right. Computers occasionally make mistakes. We make mistakes all the time. But when, when a computer makes a mistake, it's because a human did that by making true, a mistake in true, programming. But, but you're relying on the program to do what whoever sold you the program said it was going to do. I remember doing a story about five or six years ago. The guy was running Audi of America. He's now running VW of America. And everybody was raving about autonomy and self-driving cars. And he was like, yeah, that's Barnum and Bailey. Uh, it's going to be a long time. And, and I think he's right. Musk seems to think that it's next year and then next year and then next year and next year. I would say by 2030, autonomy is going to be, we already have it. We're, you're seeing the elements of autonomy come into your car. They're, they're called driving assist features, whether it's cruise control and lane assist and all those other things. 
Those are the building blocks. You add those all up, you finally get to an autonomous vehicle and it will save lives. You know, the numbers of people killed on our highways between 30 and 40,000 people every year, autonomy will help cut that number dramatically. From time to time, we will see reports about flying cars or hovercrafts or yeah. things like that. They're coming. Yeah. What, what are the realistic things we can look to in the near future? I, I actually, on this one, I argue uh, we've had helicopters for a long time. These are just less expensive helicopters, but a lot of the rules are going to apply. You're going to have to go someplace to get into one of these vehicles and fly someplace. The airlines are very interested in their VTOLs, vertical takeoff and landing vehicles, to basically shuttle people to their hubs. So you're in Manhattan and you need to go to LaGuardia or JFK to get a flight. Then you can get on a VTOL and and get over there, four or five people get in one and, and get over there. They're coming for you and me as an individual and getting outside our garage and jumping in one and taking off. Very complicated. The roadways are pretty simple because here's the pavement, there's the line, you know what to do. You get up in the sky and it's a whole different thing. I'm not saying they're not coming, but not when a lot of people think. I see them as a lot more helicopters, cheaper to operate. Uh, you'll probably take one to get from point A to point B at some point. I am totally averse to getting into a flying car until they are completely autonomous. I want to get in and just say, oh, take me to Seattle or whatever it is, and boom, and, and we go. I don't want to have to sit behind a wheel and actually navigate that. Well, you, you probably won't. They wouldn't want to give you control of that vehicle. And actually, that's when we get to, you, t you talked about vehicles, car vehicles. When we get to full autonomy, which is called level five autonomy, there will not be any steering wheel or pedals in the vehicle. And you've already probably been in one, a shuttle or a little that's moved you from point A to point B at a mall or whatever. That's what's coming at a bigger scale and more available. So speaking of moving from point A to point B, what kinds of other transportation are coming, like, like Elon Musk's Hyperloop or things like that? What, what can we look for down the road? Yeah, I think Hyperloop is, uh, have you heard, you haven't heard much about Hyperloop uh, of late. You haven't heard much about his boring company building the tunnels that you would use a Hyperloop in. All possibilities, it's just a question of, are they economically feasible? Do you have the rights to do it? Can you actually drill through? Well, he did it in Los Angeles, done it in Vegas. Those are all possibilities. It's just a question of what makes the most sense at the time. And supersonic air travel potentially will come back and supersonic air travel over land. I could see that by 2030, 2035 as well, where you could fly from New York to LA in a couple of hours. What about actual space travel to get places? So yeah, people have talked a lot about that of, well, that'd be really expensive, but it's, it can be done. Yeah. You, you know, you go ballistically from New York to Tokyo. Yeah. You could do it. I just don't know if, if, if there's a business case for that anytime soon. Where can people find your reports? Where can they find Full Throttle and see your videos and newsletters? So uh, I'm, currently I'm, I'm, I'm stationed at bulletin.com. So it's a really long URL. So the easiest way to tell somebody is please Google my last name, which is K-E-R-L-E-Y and Full Throttle, and you will find the newsletter. And it's Full Throttle on YouTube, which is where I'm placing a bunch of video newsletters that I'm doing of some of these. The, the, the entire URL is David Curley Full Throttle at dot bulletin dot com, which, like I say, made a mistake when I picked that URL. Yeah. Can't they use initials or something to make it? <laughs> yeah. Could have some bad advice I got along the way there on that one. <laughs> so is there anything else that you would like to answer that I haven't asked about? I just think that it, I, I watch the comments that I get. On, on a number of these pieces. And, and the one thing I would tell people is the car companies are spending three quarters of a trillion dollars to build new plants, to build cars and batteries. And people say they'll never, you know, electric vehicles will never work. I, I don't know that they're stupid. I think they're pretty smart people running these companies. Uh, they've been told that this is what their customers, the majority of their customers in the world want. And that's where we're going. 
And it's just a question of how we get there and whether we do a good job in building our infrastructure to get us to that point. There are some encouraging signs. There will be bumps along the way. It's not going to be a smooth ride. It's not going to be easy. I mean, that's why you're driving a hybrid right now, because you're not ready to pull the trigger and go fully electric. And I I have a lot of friends who've done exactly the same thing. And I get it because we're in that transition. We're in that transformation from a vehicle that we use for more than a century to a vehicle that we're going to use for probably another century. And it's not easy. And it's not what you're used to. It's different. And you have to think different. That's what I was talking about in the way you drive and charge. It's not like you want to run it down to a quarter tank of gas and then go get a refill. Sometimes you may need to charge at 66%. And sometimes you can go to 22%. There's a lot to learn, and we're all going to have to adapt, but it's coming. Okay. Again, I think the answer is hamsters in a wheel. I'm I'm sticking to that. You're going to find have to find a bunch of alfalfa to feed them. That's hey. I think there's some down the road. I think I'll get that. David, thank you so much for your time. I hope you will come back and share more with us on other transportation topics. My pleasure, Steve. Great fun. Always love talking about this stuff. I uh. It's a remarkable period we're in the midst of. There will be a lot of change coming. Yeah, those of us who grew up with the Jetsons are now living it. It's getting closer, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. Thanks a lot. My pleasure. Thank you to David Curley for filling us in on the future of transportation. Check out his Full Throttle newsletter and YouTube channel. I don't know about you, but I'm excited about going electric. Eventually. New models are coming out all the time and the prices are coming down, so consider trading in the old for the new. You'll help to clear the air and, who knows, maybe you'll get a charge out of it. If you like this program, like us and subscribe on social media or wherever you find fine podcasts. Life Slices is produced by Beatnik Ravens Productions, all rights reserved. Music courtesy of Fesleyan Studios. (laughs) 